Hey everybody, welcome in. David Summers with the Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller, and the very first episode of Stud Stories. Okay, Stud, you wrestled a long time with some really talented individuals. 11 NWA champions. Maybe not all of them were champions when you wrestled them. Maybe they were in the past or maybe they were going to be in the future, but you really wrestled some very gifted individuals. So let's talk about some of those incredible matches with some of these gifted individuals. Yeah, I want to welcome, first of all, Dave, uh, all of the great fans, man, that are out there on Southeastern Rewind. And, and I, I've been uh, wanting to do some special things and uh, tell some stories. And uh, and I kind of kind of want to tell some stories. That, I guess this is the first one that uh, we're going to be doing in a long series of them. And every once in a while, when I feel like it, I'm going to go and uh, tell another one. But uh, I've always wanted to talk to the fans about the matches I had with NWA world champions. Some of them were champions when I wrestled. Some weren't champions. Uh, some were uh, in their prime and some were far past their prime. You know, I think it's an inter interesting uh, subject matter and uh, and I'm going to have a lot of fun doing it. And I, and I hope fans out there on Southeastern Rewind are going to enjoy listening to them. And you're exactly right. We're going to be talking about in my 17 year career, I wrestled 11 NWA champions. Either they were champions when I wrestled them or maybe they weren't at that point. You know, this series of stud stories, you know, I'm going to discuss uh, one champion for every story. And then I'll give a brief history of each, obviously. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about how long they were champions. What was their wrestling style like? Uh, discuss the actual match or maybe matches I had with them. In some cases, and in most cases, uh, convey a personal story or two about each of them when mm -hmm. possible. Yeah. So these, these NWA uh, champion uh, stud stories are going to be uh, on Southeastern Rewind channel. Not every week as I just said, but every once in a while, when I feel like it, I want to throw one on there for fans. And uh, <laughs> I think, and I hope that they really enjoy them. If they see that the numbers are good and there's a lot of viewership, uh, we'll crack them out maybe a little more off. Obviously out there, if you're listening to me today, uh, I hope you're going to enjoy this. This is kind of a part, I, mean, I consider this to be a part of my family's wrestling history. And, I, and I'm really proud to be able to share this with all of the great old school fans out there listening. Let's start back uh, with the National Wrestling Alliance before we even talk about the first world champion I want to have, have conversation about. Uh, the National Wrestling Alliance was formed in 1948, which happens to be my birthday. And the year I was born, uh, it was an organization of individual wrestling promoters that were basically willing to share a world champion. Uh, never been done before. Uh, and that made it the first of its kind, the National Wrestling Alliance. And, and it would become not just a National Wrestling Alliance of promoters and owners from across the country, but around the world. So, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, it's going to be quite a few years in the process of being there and, uh, and having these great champions uh, that uh, represented the National Wrestling Alliance, all the promoters of that company. And uh, I was proud to be one, uh, got to be one myself, 1975, uh, right after, uh, within months of establishing my first company, Southeastern Wrestling, I was uh, made an application to be a member and it was obviously accepted pretty quickly since my father and my grandfather had been members before me. So I'm proud to say my grandfather, speaking to him, Roy Welch, was one of the original founders of the National Wrestling Alliance. He, and, uh, you know, the first NWA champion, and uh, a lot of people probably don't recognize this name, but we're going to go back to 1948. Uh, it was, was a guy named Orville Brown, and uh, he held the belt for almost two years, uh, starting in 1948. Uh, with the first, He was the first champion of the National Wrestling Alliance, and he held it almost to the end of 1949. So... Uh, by golly, let's just dive into some real wrestling history with the NWA World Champions. Uh, this is my stud story number one. And uh, we're going to start with a guy named, and uh, this name is going to freak you out a little bit, Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, it did me because I, I really wasn't aware of it until lately. Uh, this guy's name was Aloysius Martin. Wait, Did that's you, the name of, of a champion? That's, the na that's his real name. Okay. Aloysius Martin. 
Uh, can you figure out who that could be, man? If uh, way back that that far, yeah, I'm going to throw 1949. it. 1949. He wins the title in 1949. One of the greatest ever, Luthez. At a boy. Wow. A okay. dog, man. <laughs> but is Alawisa smart in a long way from Luth S, Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, would have never picked that up on the street, no. <laughs> yeah, no, no. You know, and I mean, uh, you know, Luth S, I don't even know how he came up with the name of Thez. I mean, that is enough, but yeah, uh, yeah. I can see why he changed his name. You know, that that makes sense. So, uh, yeah. you know, so Lou won the title from Orville Brown on November 27th. 1949 and he held the belt this is on his first run he has several runs as world champion uh he held the belt on his first run for almost six years straight uh and this was considered by many the greatest nwa champion of all time and he's going to be off and on he's going to be champion off and on for more than 10 years total time uh, he was trained by a by two wrestlers. Uh, one guy was named George Trag Tragos. Uh, he was a very much feared uh, freestyle Greek wrestler, man. Uh, way, way back in the day. Obviously, this is uh, this is back uh, in the it, actually before the 1930s. You know, uh, so Tragos was around, and and uh, and then there was another one named Ray Steele. Uh, both of these guys were kind of in St. Louis area, in the St. Louis area. And uh, so uh, they trained him uh, in freestyle. Uh, Tragos uh, trained him in some shooting, uh, Ray Steele more in, uh, in the professional style. And they trained him for about four years, man, which is a pretty long time to be trained before you ever get a shot in the ring. Hmm, wow. yeah, it's kind of similar to my grandfather, Roy, in his uh, dealings with with uh, the great the great the great old timer out there in the in the west, the Dutch Mantel, the original Dutch Mantel. Hmm. So 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 uh, um, Lou has his first professional match in 1932. So you'd guess the other one pretty good. How old do you figure he was uh, in his first professional match? I would I mean I would have to say he was in his 20s, but I, I don't know if that adds up. Uh, he was 16 years old. Are you kidding? Wow. 16 years old when he got in the ring in St. Louis uh, <laughs> in 1930. Just a boy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just a boy. Yeah. Just a boy. But uh, gosh, a really talented, obviously, boy to be able to, for a professional company to put him in the ring at that point. So, and as a pro, uh, he got managed by one of the best wrestlers of all time, one of the best professionals of all time, Ed Strangler Lewis, who was uh, just a phenomenal wrestler, phenomenal athlete, a big, huge guy for back in his time frame in the 20s, a huge star in the 20s uh, and into the 30s. And uh, he managed and he helped train uh, Lou, th Lou some, especially once Lou became a professional. And uh, this same Ed Strangler Lewis actually worked with my father a lot when dad was a young wrestler too. Uh, he was a real good friend of my grandfather, Roy, and uh, they went back a long way, obviously. So, uh, you know, uh, Lou's getting the training by some tremendous talent, that's for sure. And now he's being managed as a young pro by maybe the greatest wrestler of all time, or one of the greatest, and, uh, and uh, who was a big-time manager for many, many years after he was no longer able to wrestle. And that was uh, the great Ed Strangler Lewis. And uh, during Lou's illustrious career, you know, he wrestled at least 11 members of my family alone. And that's a pretty big statement right there, you know, uh, to have a big enough family that 11 of them Russell Luthez in his career. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm going to name off those because I don't always tell a lot about my family members. Some of them's names may not be as familiar as others, but obviously he wrestled Roy. He wrestled against Herb. He wrestled against Roy and Herb's brother, Jack. It was about the same age as Roy and Herb was. Then Lester is the fourth and uh, in that first generation of professional wrestlers. And Lester's about 20 years younger than Roy. 
uh, he's actually close to my father's age. So he wrestled uh, the first generation entirely, Roy, Herb, Jack, and Lester. Then he wrestled my dad, who was uh, uh, went to uh, wrestle his buddy, Fuller, obviously. And then he wrestled the three Fields brothers, who were uh, my granddad's uh, sister's children. Okay, And uh, their name was Bobby and Lee and Don Fields, the Fields brothers. Uh, then I wrestled him. Then he wrestled my brother, Robert. And then he wrestled my cousin, Jimmy. So, uh, and, and besides uh, 11 of them uh, being uh, guys that he wrestled, uh, seven of those people I mentioned were owners of territories. So, you know, we, we've been around a long time. Uh, we had a lot of uh, experience in the ring. And a lot of us had experience far beyond just the ring itself. So he was not the NWA champion when I wrestled him. I said that that would be the case for some of these world champions that we're going to be talking about in these stud stories. And I had three matches with him in my career. Lutez was a recognized great shooter. And uh, when you locked up with him, you could tell. He just had that feel about him that uh, the grip and everything else that just uh, – it got your attention instantly that th this guy's no normal wrestler, you know. And uh, and most most wrestlers, I'm sure, were like me. First time I went in the ring with him, they were extremely nervous to get in the ring with Luthes. And uh, when I wrestled him, he was probably in his fifties. And uh, before my mer first match with him, my grandfather's brother Herb, I talked to Herb. Uh, uh, a couple of days before the match, and he, you know, well, he was asking me, well, who you been wrestling and what, what's going on? And I said, well, I'm supposed to wrestle Fez in two nights, two nights from now. It's a couple of days later. Mm -hmm. And uh, Herb had some advice for me. <laughs> I, I bet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, because he had wrestled him many, many times. No telling how many times uh, Herb had wrestled him. But Herb said to me, he says, uh, Ron, you, you need to watch his wrist lock. You know, and, uh, so I was like, well, well wait a minute, you know, <laughs> was it, or why his wrist lock of all the moves that he's got and all the things he's likely to do to me, why would you focus on his wrist lock? And he said, because if you don't run, because when he reaches and gets that wrist lock, he said, he'll have your body, he'll have your arm in front of your body. And he says, uh, if you're ready or not, He's going to just go straight backwards. And uh, and if you bend your head forward and roll over, you might keep from breaking your arm or tearing your shoulder out. Ooh, okay. But if you don't run, he goes, <laughs> he's going to he's going to bury you face first in the mat. And then he's going to run that shoulder, that wrist lock behind your back and up your back. And he says, it may be over right there. Yeah, it, yeah, it could be. <laughs> so, so, you know, and then he says, you need to expect he's got a hell of a grip, you know. And uh, and after wrestling him the first time, I, I likened his grip to Danny Hodges. He felt like when he grabbed a hold of you, like uh, he had like he had the grip of a Hodge. And uh, wow, we've had talked about it many times. That Danny Hodge used to take the apple and just uh, catch it in his hand and squeeze it into pulp. Wow. Break the handles out of <laughs> steel wire pliers. And I mean, just an unbelievable grip. And Thez had a lot of that same grip with, about him. And, uh, you know, but the difference between Danny Hodge and Lou Thez is Danny was grew up a great amateur wrestler, but was not so knowledgeable about professional wrestling and how to really hurt you. He didn't have that shooter background that Lou had. Lou knew how to hurt you. And, uh, wow, you didn't want to mess with Lou. You didn't want to mess with Danny either, but you certainly didn't want to mess with Lou. So, um, and then I got one other quick story here, man. And this one comes from the late 1960s when I was at the University of Miami playing basketball still. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lou, Lou Thez came on the Johnny Carson show, which was really popular back in this Back in the 70s, uh, uh, late 60s, uh, yeah. you know, Johnny Carson's show was the big thing at night. Absolutely. Uh, Ed McMahon, his big, his big co-host, Ed McMahon. You are correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, about twice the size of Johnny, right? <laughs> right, and, uh, exactly, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, me and the boys are sitting there, you know, like we did, all college students at night watching TV and uh, NBC, I think it was, the old Johnny Carson Network. Uh, you know, they said, hey, Luthez is going to be on the Johnny Carson show a couple of days later. So, wow, when it came time for the show to be on, uh, uh, the living room in the dorm I was in filled up. Not just me, but all of my buddies. And they, you know, they wanted to see how Lou was going to do on TV. And so did I. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, you know, so, and, uh, you know, I'd met uh, Lou several years earlier uh, through my grandfather, uh, once with my grandfather and several times around my dad. And uh, Lou knew who I was. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, he, uh, at this point, he was a major, major star in wrestling. And, and I was kind of really hoping, man, that old Lou was going to make me proud in front of all my buddies here, you know, that they weren't going to say something or do something to Lou to uh, make professional wrestling look bad. Right. And that used to be the thing back in those days. Uh, it, it was kind of common that people thought, oh, this is all a big joke. And uh, so, you know, but Lou had a different whole uh, presence and everything else. People treated him with respect. So I looked it up on Google when I started thinking about this, you know, I thought I want to tell this story about, and it, the date of this episode was May 18th, 1968. And it was in my third year of college. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, on this show, uh, uh, Lou was, Lou was so classy and he dressed great. Uh, he always wore the suits Uh he had a, he just had an aura about him, man, that the believability. And uh, so, you know, he and Johnny had the conversation like they normally do. He sat down at the seat there next to, uh, the, to the desk uh, with uh, Carson. And down on the end of the couch was Ed McMahon. It was this, you know, that was the scenario of the old days. And for those fans that saw the Carson show, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And for those that didn't maybe get a little idea, Johnny Carson's a, uh, a tremendous star in oh, the yeah. country. One, oh, yeah. one of the biggest names ever, right? They, I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, and so uh, he has a nice little conversation with Lou. And then, you know, he says to Lou out of the clear blue, he goes, well, you know, he goes, uh, a lot of people don't really believe the wrestling is real. And he goes, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and they, they see you guys pick each other up and slam each other and all that stuff. And he goes, uh, you know, uh, 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 how about, uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't ask you to slam me, you know, he says, <laughs> cause, you know, yeah. I, I don't weigh very much, but he says, Ed McMahon there weighs more than 200 pounds. And, He's a pretty big guy. Hey, could you <laughs> slam Ed McMahon? Here it comes. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Carson used to do this to poor old Ed McMahon a yeah. lot. <laughs> and Ed McMahon obviously starts right away. No, 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 no. Uh, I believe he can do it. You don't have to show me, you know. So uh, anyway, uh, Lou gets up, uh, you know, and he takes off his suit coat and uh, he lays it over the couch. And, uh, and McMahon don't want to get up and Carson, you know, oh, come on, uh, you know, Ed, hey, he's not going to slam you. He's not going to drop you. He's just going to pick you up. And, uh, you know, so finally Ed gets up off the couch and, uh, and he collude. And, uh, so I'm thinking now, you know, uh, I know Lou's strong as heck, you know, but, uh, uh, Ed McMahon was a very big guy. Yeah. He was probably six, four. Yeah, you know, yeah, and he probably weighed two fifty, more like two fifty than two hundred. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, I'm thinking, geez, I don't know about this, you know, because uh, if someone knows what you're going to do to them and you're going to try to pick them up to slam them, they have a tendency to back up and throw their weight down toward their rear end. Right, and it makes it harder for you to get them up. Yeah. They can block it. It's kind of like they, they don't go up there real easy. They kind of block it so that you can't pick them up. It's a natural tendency. And uh, so, so, and I'm wondering, now, how's Lou going to deal with this? And so he's talking to Johnny Carson and he's standing face to face with Ed McMahon and he's looking over to Johnny and, uh, and he, He's saying to Johnny, you know, well, you know, he says there's a there's a way to do this that's easier than than normal, and you know, he's he's very calm. You don't know he's got anything in mind, and then 
he's looking at Carson and he looks back at Ed McMahon and just the second that he looks at him, he reaches over and takes the heel of his hand and he pops Ed McMahon in the forehead like a little tap. Pow. And <laughs> Ed McMahon's head snaps back a little bit and it throws him off guard and he reaches right in there and he picks him up. Right. He's got him <laughs> right up in the air. Wow. Ed is, yeah, I mean, it was like that, just like that. I mean, every one of those boys in that room with me were like, wow, look at that. Jeez. You know, they couldn't believe that he could do it that fast. But, you know, he was a smart dude and mm -hmm. uh, he, he knew how to set McMahon up and uh, he made it look simple. He made it look easy. It was a it was a big night for me. I remember the guys were like, gosh, Ron, man, this is pretty. This is amazing, man. Didn't have any idea these guys were this strong. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, a little odd story, you know, but uh, yeah, I, it just happened to remember it when I was thinking about doing this first one on uh, Lou Thess. So uh, to finish this up, you know, uh, obviously Lou had a lot of class, uh, maybe one of the classiest world champions of all time. I think Flair dressed kind of like him and Flair tried to emulate him. But, uh, you know, uh, it was hard to do that. Uh, you know, uh, Lou always was dressed in a suit. And he always looked like a world champion. Yeah. And and I think many NWA champions that followed him, like I said, like Flair, they tried to emulate Lou. I mean, he was the uh, <laughs> he was the role model for world heavyweight champions, and he was one of not just for the world champions, but he was a great role model for every wrestler. Basically, from about the 1930s all the way into the 1980s, he was still in the ring. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So he had a tremendously long, long career. He was considered to be one of the last true shooters in professional wrestling. Yep. And uh, a lot of people described him as a quintessential athlete, man. I mean, he was basically a polished warrior, man. He could break a guy in two if you pushed him in the wrong direction, if you tried him. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was like, oh, no, you don't want to mess with him, man. Yeah. So uh, Lou did uh, until he died in 202. 2002, uh, and like I said at the beginning of this, is he was right, widely regarded as one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, and uh, maybe the single greatest world champion in history. He was the most, he was the last accepted world champion in Japan that the people really believed in, you know. And uh, in Japan, he was known as the god of wrestling. That's basically they had a word for it. I couldn't pronounce it, <laughs> but uh, if you talk if you talk Lou Thez, uh, they all, they had the uh, word for Lou, and uh, I only asked Jojo, the interpreter over in Japan, when I was there in '83, uh, what is that they're calling Lou Thez? And he says the god of wrestling. Whoa! So, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and he really was, and he went over there and wrestled Ricky Dozan and uh, some of the greatest wrestlers that japan had and obviously i bet you every time he left there they had more respect for him than they had when he came uh and he by himself probably had more to do with the growth of national wrestling lines than any other wrestler in history so uh, you know dave uh, this is the first one a little stud story and uh, and i hope everybody out there has enjoyed this story and uh and i'm going to do one on all 11 of the NWA world champions that I had the opportunity to be in the ring with. And uh, each one of them was going to have his own stud story. Cool. And the next one, as a matter of fact, is going to be about a wrestler. I wrestled in Southeastern in 1976. He was born in New Zealand. His name was Pat O'Connor. And he had just as big a part in advancing the popularity of the National Wrestling Alliance World Champion as Luthez did, in my opinion. Uh, Pat O'Connor was a tremendous athlete who uh, actually invented several wrestling moves that will never be forgotten. They're still used today. Uh, one of, and they one of them was named after him called the O'Connor Row. And uh, it's just uh, you've seen it. People see it in every match. Uh, just about in the old days, uh, sooner or later, in the, just about all matches, you're going to see that O'Connor role. So, uh, and he happened to be a personal friend of mine, one of the guys that really took me under my under his wing. 1973, when I started going to St. Louis and wrestling in the biggest and most uh, famous wrestling city in the in the world, 
uh, practically uh, every other weekend in 73 and 74. So it's, it's uh, Pat O'Connor in the next one. And uh, thank everybody out there uh, for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, stud story. And uh, we got a lot more of them coming in the future.